Hello and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor Esser, and with me as always is... Phil Perch. Hey, Phil. Always glad to have you. So, um, big news today. Not exactly Marvel news, but still comic book and connection related news. Um, Superman's old foe Brainiac is out to take him down in his battle with uh, Batman v Superman. Uh, have you heard about this, Phil? No, I have not. Uh, you have not. Okay, so apparently a um, some computer scientists have created a logarithm to predict what movies are likely to turn an adequate profit. And not for nothing, the profit they're seeking to turn is $7 million. They say that they felt that $7 million was a reasonable return on any investment. Clearly, these guys don't know Hollywood, but they're saying $7 million is is a profit that they're expecting. Um, and this is the big story, is they predicted Batman v Superman only had a 37% chance of having a $7 million or more return, which is pretty bad. You know, let's not sugarcoat this. It's pretty bad. Now, you can say, well, what does a computer know? Well, I actually did a little reading on this to see, because I was very curious. Like, how are they coming to these numbers? What are they basing it on? And here's actually what they're basing it on. They're basing it on the director, the stars, their previous work together, and the the likelihood that this is going to be profitable. And what what it actually comes down to is you have two big – you have Zack Snyder, whose previous movies, although relative successes were also considered commercial, if not failures, not astounding successes. He did Watchmen, which – you know, didn't which underperformed. It did well. I th- I don't think it lost money, but it but it underperformed. He did three hundred again, did well, but I think underperformed. And of course, his big the thing that actually ties him to this is he did Man of Steel, which definitely did well, but underperformed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you add onto this also Ben Affleck, who is a name actor who is demanding a lot of money. To be a part of this, well, at least theoretically, although he may have actually, because he is a bit of a comic book fan, may have actually took a bit of a pay cut to play Batman. We don't know. Um, And that, um, you know, and a guy who has had a long series of failures. Um, They also base this this logarithm on when the film is being released. Um, And and. Factors such as this. So it actually seems relatively sound. Now, things it could not factor is, you know, fan fervor. Um, and, you know, and they're, they're honest about that. They said, we can't factor in something like that. We can't factor in the fact that because it's Batman v Superman, that people are just going to show up just for that name. But truth be told, and this is the thing of it, truth be told, showing up just for a name isn't enough. You know, if you're Mm -hmm. just showing up because it's Batman v Superman, that might get you an okay opening weekend. Unless, of course, the feedback right away is mm, not good. You know, Um, to give you an example, Fantastic Four had probably every person who's ever liked the Fantastic Four went to see it once. And then that was it. Uh And a lot of people who liked the Fantastic Four just skipped it because they didn't see it that opening weekend. And after that, it just wasn't worth seeing. And, you know, it it is an interesting aspect of this is how one of the things that they really factored into this was how big a star was related to uh, suggesting how much money they were going to demand related to what the likelihood of this product being good and again that's what the whole what is the history of these you know has this director worked with these actors before and if so what was the result and um so you know it's 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 a it's it it is an interesting complex algorithm and as a point of order saying it has a 37 percent chance of turning a product greater than seven million dollars isn't to say that it is like it, it is a failure 
it is to say that the odds of it being a success beyond making its money back is unlikely. And as an example, because this film costs so much money to make, it could be the number one film in the country uh, for two, three weeks straight and not make its money back. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest problems with a superhero epic, especially if they're going to do it like they're doing with this, where it is a lot of crammed in superhero superheroes and a lot of big set pieces. And that costs a lot of money. And every time you put in that much money, you run the risk of not making enough for the return. Uh, this is, this is the Cleopatra conundrum. The most Pro, the, the, and this this was this is um, the adjusted for inflation. The highest grossing movie of all time, I believe, is still Cleopatra. Huh. Likewise, adjusted for inflation, the biggest flop of all time is Cleopatra. Huh? Huh? This is the um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Dark haired woman, very famous ingenue. Um, Elizabeth Taylor. This was Elizabeth Taylor's big breakout hit. She played Cleopatra. Uh, it was a big, uh, big, big blockbuster. And it made millions of dollars, but it cost more. So you had this problem with this film that was just hugely successful. Inarguably one of the classic great films of American cinema, but at the same time lost money, because, not because it didn't have people who went to go see it, but because they spent so much money to make the dang thing. And you come into these things when you're looking at something like Batman v Superman, where yes, you have a proven product with Batman and Superman. They are the, mo the two most iconic characters in the world, in American literature, I would have to say, that Batman and Superman are the most iconic characters. But if you spend this kind of money on it, and you don't have a proven director, which, of course, you know, one of the films they didn't do, they didn't break down uh, Captain America. But, of course, in Captain America, you've got a, the Russo brothers who are a proven quantity with Chris Evans, with Anthony Mackie, with the heroes, with, with at least two of your stars in that. So you know going into that that they have a little bit more cachet. You also have release times. You know, um, Batman v Superman is coming out in March, which is not a big uh, movie season, whereas Captain America, v, uh, Cap Captain America Civil War is coming out in um, May which is the start of the big blockbuster season. So DC kind of Mar Warner's kind of hurt themselves with their scheduling. They spent a lot of money. They've got an untested director. Well, not an untested director, but a, te a director that's tested rel relatively poorly historically in, and, and not to say he's a bad director. He's, I actually think that visually he's a fantastic director. I think Zack Snyder really gets comic book the comic book ethos. I think he is, he's actually, I'm going to say probably one of my favorite visual directors currently working that said, you know, he has not made films that really get the excitement of people going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And that's, that's the problem. You have all these things conflating into this and, and not for nothing. There is, always an urge of schadenfreude out there where people want to tear down any film, no matter how good it is. I mean, how many, every time any new Marvel film comes out, there's always, well, this is the film that shows that Marvel really isn't as, isn't invulnerable or this, or Pixar the same way. This is the film that shows that Pixar isn't really invulnerable. And all of those films always wind up making money. You know, I think good dinosaur maybe didn't do as well as the other ones have, but I think good dinosaur was always a tough sell and had to be reworked a lot. But I still say it was a decent film. Um, but the whole thing with the whole thing Batman v Superman, do you mm -hmm. think I know you said, you know, the, the whole name thing and everything isn't going to carry it all through. But I mean, 
I would think more than even the Marvel movies, especially even Deadpool. It's like, it's find me someone on this planet who doesn't know who Batman and Superman are. You're going to have to go to a pretty remote locale to find someone who doesn't recognize Batman and Superman. No, no, no. And and without a doubt, like I said, and I said, they are the the two most iconic characters in in um in 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 American literature. And here's what I'm going to say that also works against them. Mhm. Because they are so iconic. You know, here's the thing. When you try out Iron Man, truth be told, even if people know who Iron Man is, most people don't have a preconceived notion of Iron Man. And in many ways, that was the failing of Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that people necessarily rejected Snyder's view of of Superman so much as it wasn't their view of Superman? Because I'm sure there have been dark tales of Superman in the past. Heck, Alan Moore wrote Superman stories. I'm certain Alan Moore wrote Superman in some dark and twisted ways over the years. Um, you know, that's not to say anything negative about Alan Moore. I'm just saying the guy has a penchant for telling, you know, tales that 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 examine the darkness in 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 anybody's soul. And I can't imagine that he passed up the opportunity to examine the darkness that might exist in Superman's soul. Um, you know, so I'm not, so Zack Snyder's view of it is based on, you know, the Superman that is in his head. But the problem when you go into a character that is that well known, that is that iconic is that everybody has a headcanon Superman. Not everybody has a headcanon Tony Stark. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a Marvel fan. I didn't really have a headcanon Tony Stark until Iron Man came out because I knew who Tony Stark was. I knew who Iron Man was. I'd read a few Iron Man. I knew about, you know, Demon, the Demon in a Bottle storyline. I knew about Tony Stark, but he wasn't a character that I had excessively strong feelings about in the same way that maybe I would have had about a Ben Grimm or Reed Richards or mm -hmm. Johnny, you know, my fantastic four, which of course was my iconic characters or my captain America, which was my other, one of my other go-tos, you know? Um, and so when you go into that, even people that like it may not have a strong headcanon. And so they're willing to accept what you do. When you go into a Batman or a Superman, everyone's got a headcanon. They've got a headcanon from the books, and especially with a character like Batman and Superman, because they have a canon from the books, they have a canon from the TV shows, they have a canon from the movies, from the cartoons, from everything that that, that is out there, all of that multimedia property. And this is, you know, and this is maybe the real negative to DC having multimedia properties and letting everything be its own thing is that you've got people coming in with their own headcanons on all these characters and all these situations. And then they sit down at the movies and they're like, well, that's not Superman. Even though it's very much a legitimate view of Superman, it's not who their headcanon of Superman was that, you know, their Superman wouldn't snap the neck of Zod spoilers. If you haven't seen man of steel yet, um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, you know, I mean that's that's the thing, and and that and that's what everyone comes to. Now, truth be told, Superman in a desperate situation, having to use violence, that is something that yes, I mean, in my head, Kenan, I can see that happening. You know, I'd like to not think of it happening. Um, it's a little more disturbing to me the idea that he actually killed that family when he did it, because <laughs> someone pointed out the way he snaps the neck, he actually moves his head towards the family. <laughs> So that the ray beams actually hit the family. But, and then we never see them after that. We don't see that they're safe. We just see that he pulls his head towards them. I just, I, there, there, there was, just, yes. There was a storyline yeah, yeah. where um, Superman did, he he was taken to it like an alternate earth. And there was, there was Zod and two other uh, Kryptonian criminals. And they killed everyone on that other earth. And they said, well, Guess what? No matter what, we're going to find our way to your Earth, and we're going to kill everyone on your Earth, too. So Superman pulled out this kryptonite from that Earth that was lethal to them and killed them. So, And there, there is precedent for him killing 
Well, yeah, yeah, and it's not it's not at all weird. I mean, I, I think there's other choices that Zack Snyder made in that film, or whoever wrote the film made, and then Zack Snyder kept it. That you know are, are weird. I mean, I think that the, the, the I, I think actually their their take on Jonathan Kent was probably even more more bothersome to to a lot of fans than necessarily their take on Superman. I think yeah. Superman kept something of a blank state, but Jonathan Kent, you know. You know, Jonathan Kent is the moral. So he's the Uncle Ben of Superman. He's the yes. one who gives Clark his moral center. Um, and I think he kind of stepped away from that a bit and, and kind of made really in many ways Jonathan Kent the antagonist of the film. And, um, which, you know, kind of, I think kind of worked counterintuitive. And then other, you know, um, you know, but, 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 but all that is said. You know, the problem when you have an iconic character, which is actually, you know, I think kind of something that that um, as many Marvel characters have gotten more popular, I think that this is a problem you have. I think that that was one of the big problems when you got to the Amazing Spider-Man series um, wasn't necessarily that they were not as good of Spider-Man stories, but that they were different enough Spider-Man stories and this is the problem when you do a fast reboot, that it was a different enough Spider-Man story that people who had a headcanon on Spider-Man were like, well, that's that's not who Spider-Man is. That's not the Spider-Man story, you know? Um, you know, which is really why a fast reboot is not a good idea. Unless, and like I said, here's the exception, unless the previous uh, version failed, you know? Mm. I mean, you, you can do a new... You know, when when you're doing a new Daredevil, no one's saying, "Well, you know, in the Ben Affleck Daredevil, that was that isn't really how Daredevil was." You know, no one's no one's calling back to that. No one's calling back, even though I actually didn't mind the, um, you know, the the previous two Fantastic Four movies. When the new Fantastic Four movie comes out, no one's saying, "Well, you know, that that was the way it should be, and this is the this is it." It's like, no, they're both. You know, not perfect films. And, of course, the current Fantastic Four, when that gets rebooted, no one's even going to mention that one. Because that was just not good, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but actually speaking of the Fantastic Four, that brings me to another point about something that I think can work against DC in this. Is what you can say is trust. And my example for this is that, you know, um, I, after taking my kids to see Fantastic, Fantastic Four, I will not take them to see another Fox uh, Marvel movie, Sight Unseen, because I felt that film went way over the line. And if you look at, like, the DC films, which are doing the dark, and, the, you know, I don't think I would necessarily take my kids to see Nolan's Bat, any of Nolan's Batmans. I don't think I'd take them to see uh, Man of Steel, you know, in the theater without seeing it myself first and making sure that it was good. Mm -hmm. So with DC, even though they're not going for an R rating, there are probably a lot of parents out there that are like, you know, I don't know if this is the film I want to take my kids to see. You know, Marvel films, by contrast, even though they can deal with some weighty issues and have their violence and have their 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 approaches to things, I have not seen a Marvel film yet that I wouldn't take my kids to see. You know, that yeah. I would not. The first day, sudden scene, put, drag all, all, all of us out there to to the cinema Sit us down with our big thing of popcorn and watch the movie. And I'll still go see the movie again by myself because I got to see it once where I'm not going out to get the kids more popcorn. Um, but taking my kids to those movies is a foregone conclusion. Batman v Superman. I can't say it's a foregone conclusion. Not just because we're in a Marvel household, but even if I was a DC fan, True Blue, and I had been showing my kids all the many great products because my kids love all of DC's kids' products. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Teen Titans Go, like one of their, the only thing that has come close to getting, uh, intriguing them as much as Teen Titans Go was Gravity Falls, um, which is a Mar which is a Disney product, product that Disney needs to get on and build that universe out because that is like such a great piece 
that to leave it there is just leaving money on the table. Um, you know, but even if I was going to see the DC movies, I don't know if I would necessarily do that, you know. Um, heck, yeah, even some of the you know DC TV shows like Arrow and Legends, I, sometimes I'm like, when I'm watching it with my kids, I'm like, mm, I'm not quite sure about this. Yeah, but you're yeah. an inf- you're an informed man. I mean, we do our homework, but do you think there's? I mean, you know, there's going to be people out there who don't know the details, and they're going to say, "Oh, Batman and Superman movie. I'll take my kids to see that." Well, yeah, possibly. And hey, you know, when I when I went to see Deadpool, there were kids leaving crying. You know, there no. was some take their kid out crying because they were not ready for this because they knew Deadpool from the Ultimate Spider-Man episode where, where, where Deadpool was on. Or they knew Deadpool from, you know, you know, one of the lighter Deadpool comics that are out there, you know, because there are a lot of light Deadpool comics out there, you know, including the mm-hmm. most recent Deadpool comic, which is really, really kind of light, you know. I mean, it's a rated T, but it's not insane, you know. Um... And so I can see people taking that. And then, truth be told, I actually think my youngest son, Tristan, could totally handle Deadpool. Because, of course, he's totally a monster movie guy. You know, he his favorite characters are Venom and Toxin. And he loves, you know, Jeff the Killer and the Slender Man and all of the creepypastas. He's, he, is hard, he is my hardcore horror junkie, and he's like seven. And I, I love the kid. And so I think I could take him. I couldn't take my older kid, Ben, who is much, much sweeter and much, much... Much, much less into the monster stuff. He is much more empathetic in that sense, and quite frankly, he, he likes the yokai. You know, I mean, that's that's his level of scary is the yokai, and uh, and Tristan is all about you know. Oh, I like the zombies and zombie Deadpool and Headpool, and he and he knows all of these characters because my kids go on YouTube and like do hardcore nerd, nerd research because. Mm-hmm. They're their father's son. Um, no. But that's the thing. It's like, you know, and I can, I could totally take my kid to see Deadpool. Um, I'm not going to because, honestly, it's just more than I want to deal with right now. But if if Tristan had been hyper-insistent, I probably would have taken him. I wouldn't take, have taken the other kids, but I would have taken Tristan because I know from what he likes that this would have been a film that he would have enjoyed. Um Superman, I don't, or Superman and Batman, I don't know if it's going to be light enough. I don't know. I mean, that first, that second trailer they did where they did all the jokes, it's like, oh, okay, that seemed nice. But they still ended off with, with, um, what's his name? Uh, Doomsday and, you know, cities blowing up. And I'm like, uh, you know. I mean, I may take the kids. It depends on how depends on how interested the kids are in it. One of the main reasons I took the kids to see Fantastic Four was because they got real excited about the thing drop, mm. and then they didn't give us the thing drop. You know. <laughs> so I mean, me, I'm really excited about the Wonder Woman bit. You know, I want to mm. see if Wonder Woman actually gets a good play in this because because you know, is she with you? No, I thought she was she with you. And 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 honestly, the. The backstory they're giving us for Wonder Woman is fantastic. What and you know, I'm kind of feeling a, a kind of a Deadpool fear on this is that if this movie doesn't do well, they're going to pull Wonder Woman, mm-hmm. in much the same way that we I, I knew when Green Lantern came out. I said this is going to cost us the Deadpool movie, and it sure as heck did for a decade. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I worry about that with DC that they're going to, that it's going to not do well. And they're going to say, well, now we can't do wonder woman. It's like, but that was the one thing that was good about this is the wonder woman idea. And now you're just going to toss it because the other things you couldn't manage to pull off didn't save the film. And, you know, like mm-hmm. Ryan Reynolds is green lantern. That doesn't make sense. Why would you even think that makes sense? You know? Um, does does the Green Lantern says, does the Green Lantern movie make more sense if you go in saying that's not Hal Jordan, that's Wade Wilson getting the ring? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, actually, what I actually thought was, you know, when they said he was going to be Green Lantern, I was like, oh, they're going to do a Kyle Rayner because I could yeah. totally see Kyle Rayner played by um, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds. That mm-hmm. made sense, you know. He's kind of a smart aleck and, you know, and he's more creative and all this kind of stuff. And he, he fit that mold, you know? Yeah. But, you know, um, Hal Jordan, Hal Jordan is the straight laced cop, 
you know? Mm-hmm. He's the guy for whom Green Arrow is the, you know, he, you know, one's the cop and one's the hippie. You know, that's that was the dynamic. Um, <clears throat> less so in our current Arrow incarnations, but still, you know, that was the idea that was put forth. And, um, you know, it, it's... It, it was a problem in that idea. And now it's not to say that they couldn't have done it better and that Ryan Reynolds couldn't be Hal Jordan, but that, you know, you know what, what you'll always say is like, if you don't have to force it, why do you, if you could have made, if you could have started the, you know, and as, as people make the point of, you know, for most people growing up at that point, for most of the demographic for green Lantern film, Green Lantern was actually John Stewart, and if they had cast and you know, you know, cast uh, 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 an African American Green Lantern to be John Stewart and make John Stewart the Green Lantern of the piece, people would have accepted that, you know, because that's what the fan base for Green Lantern at that point was was people that had mostly seen Green Lantern as John Stewart, um, and then you know. Then they, you know, and then they go to Hal Jordan and they, you know, they just messed it up. Uh, Who's the guy with the bowl cut? Because that's another guy that maybe I think Ryan Reynolds could have pulled off. Oh, Guy Gardner. What's his name? Guy Gardner. Oh, man. I He'd have to bulk up for Guy Gardner, but I I think Ryan Reynolds could have really embodied Guy Gardner very well, you know? Um, Well, that's what I said. I said... I mean, if they want to make a good Green Lantern movie, put everyone, put on, put them all in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and this was, you know, <laughs> I actually have a spec script of a Smallville with Green Lantern. And I actually, my actual idea was to use Hal Jordan, but I wanted to use like an older Hal Jordan, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, sort of a, um, uh, oh, who was the guy who played Steve Austin? Um I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, ah, anyway, but but that you know the you know, as this older Air Force guy who was sort of, and actually the way I'd written it up, he was kind of like coming in as like a man in black, but he was in a green, green trench coat, of course, because he's monitoring alien activity on Earth, and of course there was an alien there. Uh, it, it was it was a neat neat storyline with Sinestro and everything because that. War- Sinestro is. I had I had this line that I really loved because of course Sinestro gives Chloe his ring, which is coated in gold, so he can't use it. Mm-hmm. And you know, Clark looks at it, and uses his X-ray microscopic vision on it, and he says, "I don't know what this thing is, but it's insanely advanced alien technology." And this was my great line on this: is is she she says, "Well, how advanced is it?" And he says, "Well." If um, Kryptonians built pyramids on Earth, whoever made this ring built pyramids on Krypton. <laughs> Tell me that's not a great line. Yeah, that, oh, I, that's I, great. I, I have a whole headcanon on like Kryptonians and and the Guardians and this idea of you know if I ever get to run at DC, if I'm going to destroy, if, if I ever get to handle a reboot at DC, there's this whole thing about how the Guardians basically let the Kryptonians die because the Kryptonians were too dangerous when they got off their earth because they just wound up conquering everything everywhere they went. Because once they got off of outside of a, this weird little backwater red sun, they were too dang powerful and just rough ran roughshod over the entire universe. And that's why they were always kept on, on Krypton. And that basically they didn't let them escape. And it was only because, you know, Kal-El's little ship was able to get through the blockade to keep them from leaving. Cause you know, they were just too dangerous to let out. And then of course, you know, in this, you know, Kal-El's on earth and they don't want to just kill a little kid, but at the same time, they got to monitor and make sure he doesn't cause problems because Kryptonians are dangerous, man. One thing we've learned from all of the Superman things is Kryptonians are like really freaking dangerous because they're supremely powerful and they have no impulse control. <laughs> but you have a, you have a head, you have a head cannon for everything, my friend. Yes, I do. I know, I know. And of course, this is a Marvel podcast, so maybe we I should know. talk about let's talk something about Marvel. That's enough just piling on DC. Like they don't have enough problems. Uh, is there anything going on in Marvel right now? Well, of course, there's a very big Marvel film out right now, still going strong at the box office. You may have heard our ten minute podcast on it. 
Yeah, we're looking for the other 40 minutes. As soon as we find them, we're going to let you kids know about it. Um, uh, but that uh, that was, of course... Uh, you, know, you know what's said about that? It's like Lilith got almost no talking in that first 10 minutes. I know, <laughs> was all, I was thinking about it, yeah. You know, and I was like, she had so many great things to say, but... Got to get in there early when, when you got to get in there early. But um, yes, but um, that was a really great uh, film and really resets, I think, a lot of expectations for films going forward. And honestly, I think right now X Men Apocalypse is in this kind of awkward spot. Yeah. Because, and of course, you know, and this is the thing that I was saying about. You know, Wade Wilson, uh, not, well, yeah, Wade Wilson, Deadpool, is making this huge amount of money right now. And it's almost all profit. Because the film may cost like $50 million, and it has made over $150 million just U.S., just domestic so far. So it's tripled its budget. And, you know, that's good money. And it tripled its budget expressly because they didn't spend a lot to make it. And again, this goes to this original idea of, of Superman v. Bat- Batman, where it is a $200 million film. Which means even if this film may, did as good as Deadpool and made that $150 million in the first two weekends, it still hasn't turned a profit yet. Mm-hmm. It's got to do another $50 million. It's got to keep on going down the line until it can get to where it needs to be. And that's problematic when you're making these films. You know, um, it's great to have the big budget spectacle, but at the same time, every dollar you spend on CGI and, and cast and everything else, you know, that costs you, you know, um, you know, there's a reason I really was surprised to see Robert Downey Jr. being as big of a character in in um, uh, Civil War as he is. And honestly, we haven't seen it yet, so we still don't know how big Robert Downey Jr. is yet. Truth be told, we may well have seen all of Robert Downey Jr.'s <laughs> scenes already in Civil War, because the man gets paid by the second, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he, he, he seems like he's a major in, antagonist in this movie, so I'm thinking we're going to yeah. see a little more. No, no, and I'm sure he's in that. I, and I'm sure he's in that. But like I said, I was surprised to see him back in the armor. I really thought they were going to have him, like, they were going to kind of uh, move that over to. But I, I guess, you know, it's it's this conundrum. It's like, well, once we have Tony Stark in there, what's going to keep him out of the armor? Why is his reason for not going into the armor? And um, so, yeah, I mean, you get that. And, of course, the armor, the armor is actually cheaper than Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> You know, all that CGI armor, that's, that's actually the easy part. You know, you get, um, you know, you get, you get the stunt double in, in the, in, in the, uh, spandex and he does all the jumping around. And in fact, I think you're going to get a lot fewer scenes of the face mask flipping up on Tony Stark in Civil War. <laughs> Because <laughs> every time that face mask fa- that face mask flips up, that's another n- another another grand in in uh, RG uh, RDJ's uh, bank account. You know, I bet uh, you, I bet you, he doesn't even put on the full armor to like the like the the end of the movie, the yeah, final well, battle. No. Yeah. Well, you know, and of course we, we, you know, I've given my predictions on this, that I think that, you know, the death in it is going to be Bucky, um, that it is Cap that has to kill Bucky because he's going to kill Tony. Cause I think that's what it comes down to. I think it comes down to this idea that, um, Bucky is going to kill Tony. And as much as Cap wants to save Bucky, he realizes he can't that, you know, whatever has been done to Bucky is not something that he can fix. It's not, not something that the, it's not something the love of a good man can fix, you know, as uh, we have seen so many times in this world, you know, um, as much as Cap wants to save Bucky, Bucky can't be, can't be saved. And so I think Bucky dies in this um, uh, because that's going to be the most powerful death, you know, because mm-hmm. I think anybody else's death isn't as powerful and I think Cap's death is too predicted. So if, if 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 everyone is expecting Cap to die, and we need someone to die whose death will have meaning, you know, I mean, obviously, I guess you could kill Robert Downey Jr., but you know, I think that's cutting off your nose to spite your face. You know, he yeah. may cost a lot, but he is he is he is very important to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
<clears throat> and until you get Arno Stark in there, you can't really get rid of Tony. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's. I mean, that's my take on that. Um, you know, and of course, and again, like I said, with 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 uh, Civil War, you've got known quantities in the directors and the actors. They've already had a big budget. They've already had a big return on investment uh, for a previous film in the same genre, same characters, same same storyline. Your big, your biggest, your biggest, um, your biggest wild card in Civil War uh, is the adding of Robert Downey Jr. and Don Cheadle, and really historically, they're actually pretty good box office bets. Um, <clears throat> Robert Downey Jr. and and you know, though, actually, Don Cheadle has been in a lot of really high grossing films. Um, he's such a chameleon that you don't even notice it half the time, but he has been in a lot of very high grossing films. So, you know, I mean, I mean, that one looks really solid. Um, but of course, you know, you know, the, the, the computer program isn't saying that one will make money and one won't. It's just saying that the likelihood is different. And of course, random weird things happen all the time with films, you know, uh, films that you didn't think were going to be a hit like Deadpool wind up being insanely a hit um uh and of course that's that's one of these things that people are saying now that you know the big, biggest worry about deadpool is that people are going to take the wrong lesson from it and think that the lesson of deadpool was that people just wanted r-rated superhero films and yeah i don't think that's the lesson of deadpool i think what the lesson of dead people is people want good superhero films <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's about being good, not necessarily about being rated R. And again, because Watchmen was rated R, not as either profitable or critically acclaimed. Um, you know, and and of course, what really the takeaway from Deadpool is is that if you have people that care about the characters, care about the product, care about the story that inspires it, you're going to have a good film. If you have people that don't care about the characters, don't care about the plot, don't care about the story that inspires it, you probably aren't going to have a good film. And, you know, I think, you know, and, you know, again, a, a, a great counterexample in this is you compare Corman's Fantastic Four to Trank's Fantastic Four. Um, you know, the people who made the Corman Fantastic Four cared deeply about the Fantastic Four. It's not a good film. Um, by any stretch of the imagination, but they cared about it. They cared about the characters. The actors cared about the characters. The writers cared about the characters. They cared about the source material, and they made a film that was fun and enjoyable, even if it wasn't good. Technically speaking, Josh Trank's Fantastic Four film is probably technically a good film, but they don't care about the characters. They don't care about the source material and they didn't care about the, that story that they were telling. They were telling their own thing and fantastic four was just sort of the garnish for their, the story that they were telling. And it's not a good film because of it and lost buckets of money. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's the lesson you got to take away from this. Not, not, not what was the ancillary fact that made Deadpool a hit, but what was the core fact that made Deadpool a hit and the core fact that made uh, Fantastic Four a bomb. Because, of course, Fantastic Four could have really easily been made an R film. And as we talked about in the Deadpool film, it's really easy to get an R, you know? Getting mm. an R film, it's like it's like two F-bombs, um, International Women's Day, or... Uh, Hail to the V, and there you've got, there's your, or actually even just, you know, any male nudity will get you an R, R pretty much automatically, because men are, are not allowed to be nude in films in, in America. You you, you, you you have a Clem Cadilla Hopper on screen, and that's an R rating automatically. Um, so getting an R is not hard, you know? Um, so getting in that, you know, and Fantastic Four could have really easily been R. And honestly, I kind of feel like Fantastic Four should have gotten an R for how violent it got at the end. Because at the end, it got just really disturbingly violent. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and no. Yeah, it was just like, that is not the Fantastic Four. <laughs> what, <laughs> what movie? When did this become the ring? What happened now? <laughs> It's scanners now. It it really didn't make any sense. But again, no respect for the source material from Josh Trank. 
You know, he was not a guy who wanted, he wanted to make a superhero film. And the one that was available was Fantastic Four. So he did his superhero film on top of the Fantastic Four. And of course, that's not how you do it. You have to work backwards. You have to have people that want to make a Deadpool film. You let them make a Deadpool film and you make a lot of money rather than saying, uh, well, you got a Deadpool film to make. So, uh, and again, this was essentially what happened with Green Lantern from what, what we, what we discussed was that they were making the flash and then they put, they cast Ryan Reynolds as the flash. And then halfway down the line, they said, uh, we're not going to do the flash. Now let's just make it Green Lantern. And it's like, you that doesn't work. You can't just switch it, you know? And that's like one of the weird things about like, again, the Batman V Superman, which is this, which was this worry that everyone had was like, they're just throwing in all these random characters in here. And it's like, why are you front loading this with so, so many characters that you, that the audience isn't going to care about. And the filmmakers probably aren't caring about, you know, unless Zack Snyder is just such a nerd that he's like, no, no, I got to have all my, I want all my toys in here, you know? Sort of like how people are with Agents of Shield and Agent Carter. It's like, oh no, we got to have more more superheroes in this, you know. But um, you know, that's but I don't think that's the case. I think that, um, and again, I think Jack Zack Snyder actually does care about the characters, but he's got his own head and he doesn't really want to care about what other people's head cannon is. So, at least that's my take on it. I don't know. I don't know the guy. I've never met him. He could be a perfectly decent guy who cares very passionately about these these things and. It's something else completely, but um, right now, Brainiac says thirty-seven percent. So <laughs> we'll we'll see if Brainiac is right, or if this is just all part of his master plan, him and Lex Luthor, to destroy Superman forever. Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, I think that's that. That's a lot of connections for one week. So, what do you think? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. we had every. A lot of Marvel, a lot of DC. <laughs> yeah, a lot of DC this week. But you know what? Hey, it's okay, man. You know, I've never actually said, I know we're on the Enough Said feed, but I've always contended that super connectivity is much more than just Marvel. It is a wide-ranging field. We mostly talk Marvel because Marvel is the most interesting. But there's a lot out there, and we'll talk about it all. And if you'd like to talk about us about anything, please do so. Write to me at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. And if you'd like to tweet with me, I tweet uh, Agent Carter, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Legends of Tomorrow, occasionally The Flash, occasionally something else when the mood strikes me. And you can tweet along with me at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle for quality. And Phil, where can they find you? Well, if you want to get a hold of me and discuss with me how one multiverse cannot hold Charlie Esser, you can email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am at nightwingpdp. And you can find all of my creativity in one spot, uh, philparage.wordpress.com. Beautiful. And that's our connections for this week's folks. Please connect with us again. Have a great night.